Next on Unsolved Mysteries. The final desperate moments of a World War II sailor trapped inside a doomed submarine. These are vivid memories of a man living decades after the sailor's death. Is this evidence of reincarnation? A decaying marriage, a shocking case of arson, a wife is dead, and her husband is on the run. Meet Oliver. He looks like a chimpanzee, but acts like a human being. His very existence is a source of mystery and wonder. Join the war on drugs. Help find this big-time smuggler who has not been seen in 20 years. You're not going to want to miss these stories, so stick around. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. Glendora, California. Bruce Kelly grew up in Southern California in a small town just outside of Los Angeles. For his entire life, Bruce suffered from three overpowering phobias, a fear of flying, a fear of enclosed spaces, and a fear of water. Any time that I got around a swimming pool, I would be afraid to even go close to the edge of the pool. I would just walk way around it. It would even, it even was, um, to the point bad enough where I couldn't sit in a bathtub. I didn't like the feeling of water coming up around me. Over the years, Bruce tried many different treatments for his anxieties, but nothing seemed to help. In desperation, he went to a hypnotherapist who specializes in past life regression. Bruce would learn that his deep, irrational fears were the result of traumas that happened years earlier even before he was born. On the number three, you're going there now. On the next number two, you become a part of it. On one, you're there. When I was seeing what I was seeing, and I said to him, this can't be real, um, his direction at the time was just go with it. Probably 99% of the people who come to me do not go into past lives. Probably only 1% of the people have spontaneous regressions when working with phobias. And Bruce did have a spontaneous regression to a past life. Where are you? I'm in a submarine. What's happening? <sighs> Bruce was writhing in the chair. He was actually moving around and going through the death scene. Tell me your name. Johnston. What is your full name? James Edward Johnston. Bruce Kelly was James apparently experiencing the life of an American sailor named James Edward Johnston. In a moment, the, the details he recalled were vivid and specific. What's going on? Bruce, as Johnston, was drowning in a submarine, the USS Shark, during World War II. Bruce said the shark had gone down just off Celebes, an island near Borneo. Are you alone in this hallway? No, there's another man in the hallway. Bruce even knew the name of the other man trapped with Johnston in the submarine, Walter Pilgrim. Everything goes blank, and there is there's the sense that something's really wrong. There's, there's water. Bruce said in. that Johnston and Pilgrim both died at precisely 11.34 p.m. on February 11th, 1942. Are there any survivors? No. The memories were just like the, it was something that happened yesterday. They were very close to the surface. Um, they, they came up real easily. At, at first, it, it was like I was just making it up. Like, this, this really can't be happening. This really can't be real. I have to be making this up. And I went to the library more to prove that it didn't happen than it did happen. 
But Bruce was in for a surprise. He was stunned to learn that the first American sub lost in the war was the USS Shark. The very submarine Bruce had named under hypnosis. And just like he said, it had sank near the island called Celebes. They also had a crew roster there, and on the crew roster was James E. Johnston, which was the name that I had come up with under hypnosis. And it also gave the, the approximate date of loss, which was February 11th, 1942, which was also the date that I'd come up with under hypnosis. The name of the crewman, the date, the location, these were not the only facts that Bruce got right. The name Walter Pilgrim was also on that roster. He had been the chief electrician's mate. Hairs were standing up on the back of my neck when I, when I saw it. It was like, oh, God, this is real. I was in total, total disbelief and total shock. And, the, and there, was, there, was also a, there was also an element of excitement that, um, you know, maybe there is something to this. Is your mother married? No. Over the next six months, Bruce Kelly recalled more details about the life of James Edward Johnston, a man he didn't know even existed. Going to go now to your mother's death, is that acceptable? Yes. Rick ahead, Brown quickly. began to talk to Bruce as if he You're were Johnston. Now. Are you at home or in the hospital? Bruce saw himself as Johnston around age 12. He was at his mother's deathbed with his cousin, Elizabeth. Some memories were trivial. As Johnston, Bruce clearly recalled that he always ate the end pieces of a loaf of bread. Other details that Bruce recounted during hypnosis included Johnston's birth in February of 1921. As a young man, he enrolled in the Civilian Conservation Corps, a Depression-era government work program. The year was 1938. The place, Tule Lake, California. Bruce and Rick dug into government archives. What were the chances that Bruce's memories were accurate? It turned out they were. James Johnston had been in the CCC in 1938 and 1939. He was in California, and his birth certificate confirmed that Johnston was indeed born in February 1921 in Jacksonville, Alabama. How did Bruce do it? Bruce came up with a significant amount of information that was uh, well past being coincidental. There were too many lines of, of, of evidence that pointed to the fact that Bruce Kelly is the reincarnation of James Edward Johnston. It could be the reincarnation of James. Um, or it just may be some information that somehow or another that I've tapped into, and it means you know, it's, it, it's something else that's happening. I don't, I don't know. Were the images that haunted Bruce Kelly's subconscious evidence of reincarnation. Next, Bruce travels to James Johnston's hometown in Alabama and discovers more eerie similarities. James Edward Johnston died when his submarine went down during World War II. Bruce Kelly wasn't even born yet. But under hypnosis, Bruce was able to provide accurate details about Johnston's life. How is that possible? Jacksonville, Alabama. Five years after first being hypnotized, Bruce decided to visit Johnston's hometown. Unsolved Mysteries joined Bruce and Rick Brown. What you are about to see is not a recreation. At the house where Johnston and his mother lived, Bruce had a strong reaction. There's a lot of stuff here. Back bedroom's right over here. You feel that? Huh? Yeah, yeah, that's the bedroom. Okay. That's the room we stayed in. So I remember used to come in the back. There was, there's like a, there was an alley back here or a dirt road or something. Yeah? It's almost like um, he wasn't good enough to come in the front door. 
moving to the side of the house when I could actually see the bedroom and I knew that was the bedroom, that's when the feelings really started hitting. Remembering that he used to have to come in on the back street and come through the back door, the back porch, um, I remember that. I remember the feelings of kind of feeling like a second-class citizen. They were poor. She was unmarried. I couldn't vocalize it myself, and somebody off camera said something to the effect of, you're, you're, you've come home. And that's when I got real emotional, because that's exactly what it was. Hi. Say so you made it back down this part of the country. <laughs> Afterwards, Bruce Kelly meets several people who remembered James Edward Johnston as a boy. One of them is Johnston's cousin, Betty. We've heard all that you Betty's real name is Elizabeth. Bruce believes she's the same Elizabeth he saw under hypnosis, the little girl who was with James when his mother died. When Bruce first meets Betty, she asks a surprising question. Remember anything about bread? Yeah, one of the first sessions that, that Rick and I had, um, I talked to him about always uh, liking the heel of the bread, mm -hmm. wanting to get the, the end off the bread, because the, the, the only thing, the only reason that meant anything to me was um, growing up, I was the same way. My mom would bring home a loaf of bread, and the first thing I'd do is open that thing up and grab the heel out of there. Did you open both ends? Sometimes. And, and I'd get in trouble for it sometimes, too. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I did. Did you, you went to that house? Yeah. The second did. on the left? Yeah. Did you have, what were your feelings then? Yeah, well, that's, that's been the, the um, emotional high of the, of the trip. Yeah. It was, it was real difficult, real emotional. Do you feel that, that you are Edward reincarnated? I don't. You don't really feel that. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. All you know, I've been asked that question so many times, and uh -huh. all I know is, for some reason or another, I have all this information about him. I really don't know what to believe. I have doubts. Bruce said that uh, Edward used the back door, and this is is true, and not everyone would would have that knowledge. The older you get, the more you're going to look at something like reincarnation or anything that offers an answer. And reincarnation, regardless of what this religion or that religion or anything else thinks of it, it offers a solution. At the Jacksonville Cemetery, a memorial stone has been erected in honor of James Edward Johnston. No one knows the details of Johnston's final moments, but Bruce Kelly's visions provide a possible scenario. I was in my bunk when the attack happened. And everybody was heading toward their stations. I'd gotten into the first hallway when there was a depth charge. The submarine was rolling and moving. James got to his feet, and he'd gotten five, ten feet more down the hallway when there was a second depth charge. It was obviously a direct hit. The next memory I have is um, the area that I'm in filling up with water and filling up real fast. There was another man in the hallway, and he was experiencing the same thing I was, knocked off his feet a couple times, and now um, trapped in this hallway that was filling up with water. The last real image that, that I had was the, the other man in the corridor. You know, that I wasn't alone in this corridor. There's somebody else here, and they're going through the same thing I am. We are dying. I'm probably not as afraid of death as most people in the United States are or Western civilization are. Death isn't something that I, that I think about every day. Um, and I just, I just try to live every day and enjoy every day the, the best that I can. And when death comes, it comes. I think that there is something beyond. 
and I don't th I don't think it's a a final um, situation. I don't think just it's the end of. There's more. Perhaps there was more for James Johnston, who died trapped in a submarine during World War II. Perhaps, just perhaps, he had a second chance at life in the person of Bruce Kelly. Next, it seemed like a routine house fire, but it turned out to be arson, which turned out to be murder. Can you help catch a killer? White Bear Lake, Minnesota. Go do it. I just, just go do it. Gene Weaver's troubled marriage is almost over. We're done with this joke of a relationship that we're saying is a marriage that we're saying. After 17 years together, she tells her husband Gordon that she wants a divorce. This is done, Gordon. This, this is done. I'm gonna try her again. Two days later, Gene, known for her punctuality is 45 minutes late for a family gathering. Her sister, Kathy, is worried. She and her husband, Tom, drive to Jean's home to check on her. All right, we're on our way, all right? We get to the house, and I'm, I'm panicking by that. I heard this beeping noise. I didn't know what it was. I was thinking, I, I don't understand this. And then it hit me, that was the fire alarm. It was smoke obscuring the windows, and I screamed at Tom. Tom, the house is full of smoke! Dial 911! Jean! As firefighters race to the scene, Kathy and Tom search for Jean in the house. Jean! But the smoke is too thick. In the basement, firefighters discover that flames have burst the water pipes. They also discover a body. It's Jean Weaver. And then the police chief comes over and said, she's gone. And I just ran and I ran and I screamed and I screamed. I just can't begin to say how special Gene was. The fire had been deliberately set. Police believed Gene had been murdered, and the primary suspect was her husband. Gordon Weaver had every advantage in life, yet he seemed destined to struggle. In spite of wealthy parents, he was plagued by financial problems. And as his own business began to fail, he resented Gene's success. We wanted so much to find out that it was just a horrible accident, that he had nothing to do with it. But the more time passed, you know, I started to think that Cordy had actually killed Jean. It was unbelievable, but I believed it. Jean's marriage had been troubled for years. Gordon suffered from serious bouts of depression. Could you just look at me while we talk about this? What Gene would say about Gordy is that he would withdraw into himself. For many years, I just felt sorry for him because he seemed unhappy and um, just couldn't have a normal relationship with Gene. And she wasn't happy at all, but she thought it was the best for their son to remain together as a family. The day that Gene was found dead, Gordon had been working at his office and running errands. Their son was at a soccer game. Gordon returned home as soon as police called him. Uh, we were not able to give him a whole lot of information at that time, and he was asked to voluntarily come up to the police department to speak to one of our investigators, which was myself. Was my wife in the house? Is she all right? Mr. Weaver, I'm afraid I have some bad news. Was she hurt? I'm afraid your wife passed away. I'm sorry. Some of his mannerisms or behavior was not what one would expect, having come home and finding his house, you know, surrounded by evidence tape, and then being told that his wife was, you know, killed in the fire. 
and we began to suspect that he was possibly involved in the death of Gene Weaver. Investigators examined the clothes Gordon was wearing that day. They found traces of two flammable liquids. Those same liquids were also found on Gene's body. Investigators also discovered that Gene had several life insurance policies. They were worth more than $350,000 and were due to lapse just two days after she was killed. The sole beneficiary, Gordon Weaver. I believe Gordon went to confront Jane, and I believe he pushed her or shoved her. Ow! She had a wound to the head, and he panicked. And he set my sister on fire. My sister was alive when he set her on fire. Because of the fire, uh, some water pipes burst in the basement. The water pipes uh, appeared to contain the fire to the laundry room area and also help preserve her body to the point that the medical examiner could do a, a complete autopsy and uh, locate the, the head injury and some other physical evidence. Almost two weeks after Jean's death, Gordon Weaver was arrested for her murder. He was soon released on bail. The $300,000 cash bond was provided by his parents. With the indictment hearing a week away, Gordon borrowed his parents' car. They said he was going on vacation, alone. Two days later, the car was found abandoned in a suburb of Chicago. Bloodstains found inside suggested that Gordon Weaver had been the victim of a violent carjacking. Forensics determined the blood was human, but they couldn't tell if it was Gordon's. The timing of things is just all too coincidental for him to disappear or be carjacked. It's a week before that he is going to be indicted by a Ramsey County grand jury for first degree murder, it doesn't make any kind of sense at all. Two days after the car was found, a business associate of Gordon's received an unexpected phone call confirming the suspicions of the FBI. This individual identified the person as Gordon Weaver. Uh, Gordon Weaver asked if they found his car. This coworker spoke to them for just a very brief time, uh, and then Gordon Weaver hung up. We do not believe in any way, shape, or form that Gordon Weaver is dead. Why should he be off somewhere and Jean, the most beautiful person that you could imagine, is gone forever? And if I knew then what I knew now, I would never have left Jean alone for a second. The phone call makes it all crystal clear that Gordon Weaver did not die in that vehicle on that night. Gordon Weaver is still on the run. Update. After four years on the run, Gordon Weaver was captured. He was found in a remote corner of Oregon, living under the name David Carson. A woman recognized him from a mugshot on the internet and tipped off the authorities. Gordon Weaver was arrested and charged with murder. Next, he looks like an ape, but walks like a man. Is Oliver just a talented chimpanzee or the missing link between man and beast? Henderson, Nevada. Joe, come on out, Joe. We recently told you the story of Joseph Welvin Smith, who was wanted for murder. When police had entered Smith's home, they found the bodies of his wife, Judith, and his two stepdaughters. All three had been strangled and bludgeoned to death. Hello? Two hours after the bodies were discovered, Smith telephoned a family member. Joe. He denied any involvement in the murders. Joe, what's going on? It's she called her on the phone, told her that he had killed one of the people that did the killing 
and knew who the other ones were. I'm gonna find the guys who did it. I know who they are, and I'm gonna kill them. In my opinion, it was a ruse by Mr. Smith to get support from Judah Smith's family members and make them believe that he was not involved in the killings. By the time murder charges could be brought against him, Smith had vanished, but he didn't get very far. Update. Just minutes after we profiled the case of Joseph Weldon Smith, a viewer called to report that Smith was living near Los Angeles, California. He was hiding out in this motel, but managed to escape before he could be caught. Once we established that Joe Weldon Smith was in the Los Angeles area, we focused our attention to his brother, who we knew that he had close contact with. After five days of surveilling this brother, uh, we established where the suspect was residing. 20 minutes later, Smith was arrested at a second Los Angeles motel where he had registered under an assumed name. Inside his room, detectives found several credit and identification cards. Smith told police that he was in the process of creating a new identity. At the time of his arrest, Joe Smith indicated to me that he had seen the last airing of the Unsolved Mystery Program. He also told me that it was very tough being a fugitive, and he always knew that you know, someone would be knocking at the door one day. He's kind of glad it's all over at this point. Two days later, Joseph Weldon Smith was returned to Nevada, where he was convicted on all three counts of first-degree murder. He will spend the rest of his life behind bars. DNA scientists tell us that humans are just a few chromosomes different than chimpanzees. But now a chimp has been found that may bring the two species even closer together. San Antonio, Texas. A wildlife sanctuary in San Antonio known as Primarily Primates is a retirement home of sorts for some 500 wild animals. They have been rescued from medical labs, circuses, and sideshows. After years of living in cages, new residents often move in pained, halting steps. But one chimpanzee was remarkably different when he showed up. Hi, Ollie. His name is Oliver. Wow, Ollie, you stand up. Look at you. When Oliver came outside for the first time, he'd been nine years in a lab cage. He walked out, and he walked upright in a way that no chimp who was trained to walk upright would ever walk. His back is straight, his shoulders back, and his knees are locked. It's unique. In his younger days, Oliver was an international celebrity. Some said he was proof of the existence of the legendary Bigfoot. Others believed he was a completely new species. Since long before I helped start Primarily Primates, I had heard about the ape called Oliver. I'd collected old tabloid articles, and I really wondered, is this the same Oliver? I wasn't quite sure until I saw him, and there's no doubt. This is the upright walking ape who had become a living legend. Oliver had been imported from Africa as an infant in 1960. His first animal trainer, Frank Berger, was surprised by Oliver's human-like traits. The first thing I noticed with him, he was bald-headed. Chimps have hair, right with the, his bone structure. He, his head was smaller. He had a narrower face. One day I sat at a desk, and he come crawled to me, and all of a sudden, he took a hold of my pants leg, and he stands straight up. I almost faint. And within one and a half years, that animal stand up in front of me, and never I saw him went down. I've seen a lot of chips, but I've never seen one just like him. For the next 10 years, Oliver's unique characteristics were on display as a popular sideshow attraction at circuses. He was uh, billed as a missing link, 
Um, they had a window where the public could walk past him and look in and see him in his, in his exhibit. They did take him out a number of times onto a stage and, for the press uh, to take a look at him for publicity, but otherwise he was generally in this enclosure alone where people could walk past the window and see him. Oliver caught the attention of an attorney, Michael Miller. In walks this almost four and a half foot or five foot creature, uh, his hair bristling, uh, and walking absolutely upright. As they say, as advertised, I could not believe what I saw. In 1975, Miller purchased Oliver from Frank Berger for the sum of $8,000. There were many, many, many questions about uh, Oliver. Enthusiastic to the point of being wild. People were offering me money for the story. I had no interest in it. I said, I really want the story to get out, but I want to get the story out to attract serious attention from the scientific community. This creature may have interest and importance. That turned me on. That spring, he took Oliver to the annual banquet of the famed Explorers Club in New York City. Oliver created a huge sensation. It was an amazing experience because it was King Kong. I mean, that was truly King Kong. I, I would say that there was a consensus there, too, that this is a very aberrant chimpanzee. They were always grounding it in, this is a chimpanzee who's aberrant. Um, and I understood that. But when I would say, can you explain the aberration, that would be interesting. The answer was always the same, no, we can't. Oliver was then invited to tour Japan. He caused excitement wherever he went. Throughout the tour, Oliver underwent a series of medical exams. His blood test results proved to be unusual. Curiously, two of the 40 tests suggested he was not human and not ape, but something in between. These blood samples contain 47 chromosomes, one more than a human and one less than a chimp. The other cells contain 48. The Japanese doctors, however, attributed the discrepancy to human error. When the tour ended, Michael Miller found he could no longer afford to support Oliver. He placed him in a wild animal park in California. Oliver eventually wound up in a research lab. There, he languished in a five by seven foot cage for nine long years. Oliver was never used in any experiments and was finally rescued by primarily primates. I had the impression of when I saw Oliver walking bipedal that he had um, possibly been trained to walk bipedally. He could do it for quite a while. I don't think he's anything but a chimpanzee. I know that there are other animals out there we haven't found yet. Oliver very well could be very special in that he could be the only example around of a, a whole new species. After 20 years apart, a very special reunion took place between Oliver and his first owner, Frank Berger. Where's Oliver? Oliver, my God, where you been? Where you been, oh God, oh God, oh God. Attorney Michael Miller was also there. He looks happier. He looks much more peaceful. It's delightful to see that he's in such great uh, environment and that he's cared for finally. That's very, very satisfying, very rewarding. Yeah, give me a kiss. Oliver is still alive today. Scientists hope that during his senior years, DNA testing may finally solve the mystery of who or what Oliver truly is. Next, the search for the mastermind of a $40 million drug smuggling ring. Groton, Connecticut. Okay, guys, let's move in. Agents from the FBI, the Drug Enforcement Administration, 
and the U.S. Marshals Service track a fugitive to a local motel. Federal agents with a warrant! When they enter the room, the man they're looking for has vanished. Salvatore Michael Caruana was suspected of major narcotic smuggling. It was said he had ties to organized crime. He had now become the focus of an intense manhunt. Caruana hasn't been seen in more than 20 years. When FBI agents found his motel room empty, they immediately suspected that he was the victim of a mob contract hit. However, it's also possible that Caruana may have staged his own disappearance. Caruana's criminal history began when he was charged with armed robbery. Years later, Caruana had gone big time. He moved into narcotics as part of an organized crime syndicate in New England. Mr. Caruana was involved in the distribution of approximately $40 million worth of marijuana. We have testimony from just one distributor that in one particular operation, he himself brought $4 million to Mr. Caruana. Sparky, let me see what we got going here. In these marijuana operations that Caruana was involved, he was with the supervisor. Caruana would show up on the scene himself at the stash house before the marijuana was sent out and talk to his people, make sure it was weighed correctly, make sure the quality was good. He would then tell his distributor that I want X amount of dollars for each pound of marijuana that's here. I think it'll be good. What do you think? He carried guns. He was big with guns. Uh, he was big with threats. He would threaten to kill you. There was no question. If you messed up, he threatened to kill you. Eventually, Caruana was caught. His smuggling operation collapsed with the arrest of several of his key associates. Their testimony led to an 11-count grand jury indictment. Right, what you got, Against the wall, face the camera. Caruana was charged with drug trafficking and faced the possibility of a life sentence. Straight ahead. Bond was set at $500,000. He easily posted the bond and was released the same day. Two days before his trial, Salvatore Michael Caruana disappeared. Two of his close associates signed agreements with the government to cooperate and testify. I think he felt that our case was much stronger with these two witnesses coming into the case to testify against him. And I believe he just didn't want to come in and face that, because I think he felt that uh, he would face some serious time in jail. What do we have on this guy so far? I know we're... A federal task force looked deeper into Caruana's operation. They discovered that smuggling marijuana was only a small part of his criminal life. In fact, Caruana was laundering enormous amounts of money and was actually a multi-millionaire. Federal agents raided Caruana's home. It was like a fortress with an elaborate security system. They found several hidden vaults filled with weapons and financial papers. But they didn't find Caruana. Evidence led them to a condo he owned in Connecticut. But by the time they arrived, Caruana had cleaned the place out and disappeared. He's a very smart guy. He's probably one of the most cunning and sly fugitives uh, that we've come across in a very long time. Three months later, an informant led authorities to the motel in Groton, Connecticut. And we had determined he was using the alias Vincent Spirito. And based upon the information we received from the manager and the fact that the alias name was registered there at that motor inn, uh, we used that as probable cause to get a search warrant to enter the apartment. Unit one, unit four. Four to go. Four, you're in the best position. Uh, what do you see? Nothing's going on. OK, we've given it enough time. Let's, uh, let's move in, guys. When we first got into the room, it appeared like, geez, he just got up to get a newspaper that he could be coming back any minute. Hey, secure, all right? We're all secure. Okay. 
but once we started looking at specific items in the room, such as the newspaper and spoiled food, it looked like he hadn't been there for a couple of weeks. Yeah, look at this newspaper, dated May 9. We found the sawed-off shotgun with four shells up in the barrel, so it was ready to be what we call combat loaded. We also located a briefcase. In the briefcase was a semi-automatic 22 and cash. From what we found at the motor, and you could assume that he had been killed by organized crime people who thought that if he was caught, he might talk, but we don't have the body. And if it was an organized crime hit, I would think that they would want to leave the body behind so that we wouldn't keep poking our noses into his business, which eventually would lead back to them. Let's get the paperwork. I've got it. Caruana's van was missing. So were his keys, his wallet, and a camera case he was known to carry with him at all times. In the camera case, it is said that he carried an Uzi submachine gun. A month later, Caruana's van turned up at a police impound lot. It had been abandoned at a Connecticut truck stop. When marshals dusted for fingerprints, they found the van had been wiped clean. What we're looking for is somebody to come forward and tell us that they have seen Salvatore Caruana alive after May of 87. He could very well have been killed, but we really don't have anything to point to that. We don't have anybody coming forward and saying, yes, I saw him abducted from the truck stop. It appears that he's done the very smart thing. He hasn't maintained contact with the people that he knew before we were chasing him. Salvatore Caruana is six feet tall and weighs 175 pounds. He has brown eyes and graying black hair. Caruana uses the aliases John Michael Hurley, Vincent Spirito, and Face. Caruana is a licensed pilot and computer expert. He should be considered armed and extremely dangerous. If you have any information, please log on to our website at unsolved.com.